kick that over to you too. So you got food over here. And that's crazy because like when you're incarcerated, you have a time limit to eat. So you have to eat as much as you can in a short amount of time, which stretches your stomach is, is, is elasticity, you know? So you're going in there and you're eating and you're eating and you're eating because you want to fit that time frame and you don't want to waste anything. So you have to work out. If you don't, then you come out like, you know, almost 60 pounds heavier than when you went in. Yeah, so, the, the diet inside is, it's, it's Especially for women, it's you know? very, yeah. it's, 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 uh, it's very hard to and, get that off when you come out. And I think out. that's like a cool way to start this, right? Like, well, I remember when I was in uh, uh, Salinas Valley State Prison, mm -hmm. and so, so Salinas Valley sits right in uh right next to an agriculture center that's where they're growing grapes and they're growing uh all types of different agriculture right there um uh salinas valley i started dealing with a lot of rashes um and then also in salinas valley i got a i got a lymph noid on my head um and so i would recognize the plane because i had a window to see the the uh the the plantations that were next to this prison i had a window to see them so i would see this plane fly over and drop all this pesticide and i i recognized around the times that this plane would fly over and drop the pesticide and we'd go out to yard we'd get a ton of rashes we would break out in hives i mean some guys you know would get like really bad hives on their neck and uh and then i recognized i started dealing with like lymph like i got the lymph noid and it popped up on the side of my head and it was like this growth on the side of my head. And uh, and so one thing about Salinas Valley was it's it's a, a level four super maximum security prison um, and they always kept us on lockdown. So we were always on lockdown like they would let us up. There would be violence. It was very violent. Like so there would be somebody stabbed. There would be a big fight. There would be a riot. Um, and I, I pondered on it, you know, and me not being a researcher and not having been, uh, uh, you know, trained on how to look at things and see different, uh, you know, different, um, uh, I guess you could say different, um, different ways of, of how things uh, get folks to react, right? I didn't understand all this stuff until I got into college. And uh, so they would feed us small portions of food. And the food was disgusting and they wouldn't allow us to go to, to the store because we were on lockdown. Right. So we couldn't get soups. We couldn't get other stuff out of the store to feed ourselves. Right. So we were forced to eat these really tiny portions and these tiny portions wouldn't even they wouldn't even fill up a two year old kid, you know, and and then they keep us on lockdown for 90 days and feed us like that. And as soon as they opened us up from off lockdown. We were like we were like dogs that have been in a cage and and malnourished, and we'd come out and we would be violent towards each other. So it was like it it it, it, it was really uh, dehumanizing. You know what I'm saying? We would come out and we would just be violent. We'd just go off. Somebody would get stabbed. Something would happen. But it was due to them controlling our diet and that control over how much food intake we got that caused us to be violent. And that's what I think is important with this conversation is the corporate control over our food supply. It causes us to react and respond to our environment in certain ways. And I feel that violence and I feel that uh, a lot of the things that they hyper criminalize in our um, communities it, it, it's, it has a lot to play into the corporate control over our food. Um, and also, you know, the manufacturing of wine and alcohol and other things that stimulate our minds and make us respond to our communities and our environments in a, in a, in a different way, right? And so I think that that's a critical piece to kick this uh, conversation off today um, to really reflect back on my journey in Salinas Valley State Prison. The rashes, the the violence. And my question is, why did that exist? And why was that happening to us? And, uh, you know, most of the prisons that exist here in California are centered in 
different areas where agriculture exists and you know and that 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 plays a really uh huge peace and and the environmental destruction that's happening uh within all of our communities and so without further ado we'll let you kick it off and introduce the edible program and and, and just introduce this weaponization of food series uh, we really appreciate this invite to this collab awesome. thank you for starting off with that uh so my name is anthony um i work with edible campus program my, my official position is the garden and food justice education intern so I started off teaching people about how to garden and I guess the sense of autonomy that you get from producing your own foods and about how food choices are often restricted. And that led me to workshops such as these, like the weaponization of food, where we focus on the impact of unhealthy foods, uh, not culturally relevant foods, um, and I guess the corporate control of our food systems that affect us on emotional levels, uh, definitely psychological levels, they affect our bodies and they also affect our souls. It deep fragments us, deeply fragments us when we eat foods that are not culturally relevant, um, that are not good for our bodies. Uh, so that's kind of how I got, um, I was motivated to have this conversation and be here in this workshop to have um, critical discussions about our food system and about how it's a tool to um, oppress historically marginalized groups, but it also can be a tool for liberation. Um, so yeah, I was uh, hoping people <laughs> would uh, be here to share more about um, what weaponization food means to them, or how we might see food being weaponized against ourselves, um, personally or in society. Uh, but if any of you want to take on that question, please. Uh, yeah, I can relate to just a lot of what Brian was saying uh, about us being fed in, uh, small portions of really terrible food and uh, that by them controlling that food that food supply well then they can basically control us um, in order to be the best you have to eat the best you know and uh, I really truly believe that in this like short time we have on this planet we have to treat our bodies the best and we have to put the best in them so that way we're at our, always at our best and um it's been really uh i've seen through the media it's been really twisted where uh, a lot of people i think are right now are to believe that like getting good food or uh getting cheap like organic food is like out of their reach and um it's not true because even like me having an ebt with my son and my family i go to certain stores or um costco for eggs for example that are a lot cheaper and where there's a will there's a way and if you really try hard you can budget and make it um a part of your life too and you'll see that that it'll um increase the standard of living you know what i mean each time you make these little small choices to eat healthy in different little areas it's going to increase your, your your standard of living so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think the point you made about uh, being told that organic isn't accessible yeah. kind of helps to legitimize corporate agriculture and the, the damage that it's doing. Uh -huh. um, so like you're saying, putting in um, the consciousness raising to like combat that yeah. and active decision is very crucial in terms of combating production of food. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah no, that is super important. You know, uh, I feel that, you know, we're not trained on how to eat correct you know that's not something that we learn in school you know that's not something that's taught to us you know instead we're trained to consume mcdonald's yeah. burger king uh you know uh really unhealthy foods um that drive up um you know uh the unhealthy side of of what we experience and 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 and, and you know uh one of them is uh um, you know, my dad's a severe diabetic, you know, diabetes is, is, is running rampant in, in this country. And it's due to uh, this corporate control of our food, right? And then also it's due to the conditioning uh, projects where we're conditioned through media to accept McDonald's as our food supply, to accept fast food as our go-to um, uh, every single day. Um, to accept 
uh, you know, uh, Cheetos and, and, and hot Cheetos and all these different uh, brands that are advertising across our TV screens on a daily basis. They come up on our phones, they come up in TikToks, they come up all over. And that's what really uh, uh, conditions our minds to accept that we have that as our only option. We don't have another option of eating healthy, of gardening, of of going back to the indigenous ways of of being, right? Of of, of living off the land. And instead, we consume, and we're we're taught to be mass consumers, right? And uh, and we're attacked by corporate uh, capitalism and corporate corporations uh, that use our media our as its platform to um, continuously push and pump all this different stuff into our minds and we accept that is that's our only way that's our only route uh to live right and so you're right the consciousness raising is imperative we have to raise each other's consciousness and we have to break away from what we're all experiencing which is you know the corporate control of our uh movement and 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 of our ways of being uh uh here in our communities and and within our families yeah Awesome, thank you. Uh, looks like people were lost. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> awesome, thank you for bringing them. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey. Come here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Bye. We may need more chairs. Yeah. Or we could sit in the back and bring the chairs over. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Be good. Be nice. Be nice. Okay. Thank you for hey. joining us. We There's appreciate you. Here. Yeah, and then uh, we have uh, this is uh being yeah. filmed right here. Yeah. No. Oh, let me just get no, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. Sit wherever you feel comfortable, I'll sit with please. You. So we could balance it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Here, let's go back a little. Yeah. There you go. Up front. There you go. <laughs> it's funny. No, I, think no, I, I was good. stuck in a meeting with the graduates. Yeah. <gasps> we had a really view. good um, uh, meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's on. Yeah, we're good. Hey, 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 do you need help getting more chairs? I could bring some more over. And then there's a bench here, so I Yeah, yeah, we could bring this bench over here too. Look. We could put the bench maybe behind this one. Is this enough or no? Hey, I'm gonna get it for you. I got it. I think this one here. Let me try to find a silver. Yeah, I will. Yeah. We'll kind of restart the intro. Or yeah, we could restart it. Yeah. So, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, sorry, we kind of got a little lost in the shuffle, right? Um, but this is awesome. Uh, so I started off with a story, um, about my time in Salinas Valley State Prison. So I was in Salinas Valley State Prison. Uh, it's a level four maximum security prison in Salinas, and uh, it's right in the the heart of the agriculture center right there next to it is fields and one thing that i recognized being in uh new in salinas valley was uh these planes would fly over and they would drop all the pesticides and during uh the times that the planes would fly over we'd all go to the yard and in the yard we would get rashes we would start to deal with like health issues within our throat um, we would start to deal with, uh, 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 I even got lymph noids, like where my, I would get growth on my head and, and I had to surgically get these things removed. And it was due to the, I, I, I later found out through uh, 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 one of my colleagues research that it was that pesticide that they were using, right? And so one thing that I also uh, started us off with was the control of our uh, food. 
So we were, this was a maximum security prison that they kept on lockdown all the time. So we were always on lockdown. And then the, the correctional officers were the ones who would feed us. And they were the ones who would give us our portions of food. And it would be really tiny portions. Not even a two-year-old would fill up off this. But that was by design. So this was to make us violent. So we had, we were malnourished and this malnourishment would cause us to become violent. And, and right when they would open up the yard after being on lockdown with no sun, with small, tiny portions of food, right when they'd let us back out to the yard, we would become violent towards each other and it would legitimize them locking us down again. And so this is the weaponization of food and the way food, uh, uh, is used to control our response system. And so one thing that I link it to is the corporate control of our food supply and how the corporations own all of the, the food chain that we receive and they control that. And if they want to shut down certain components of our food chain that we need, they can do that. And what is our response going to be? So I feel that a lot of the violence that I saw in prison due to them controlling uh, our food and, and the food intake that we were able to receive. Uh, I believe that we see a lot of that violence in our own communities and that violence exists in our communities due to the corporate control over our food and the certain uh, uh, stuff that they put inside our food um, that, uh, that causes responses from our community members that they then go and hyper-criminalize. And that was kind of how we started this conversation out. So thank you for joining us. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Blacko. Um, that definitely ties into a discussion question that we were going to start off with. Um, but first, I wanted to introduce you to the organizations that um, are presenting this. So I'm with Edible Campus Program. Um, my name is Anthony, my garden education intern. Um, and I was uh, very motivated to, to put on a discussion workshop like this, um, especially seeing what Black was talking about his experience with people incarcerated. Um, we see this in um, historically, we talk about colonization, the mission systems, and how people are restricted from ancestral food ways. We can talk about restricted access to food and historically oppressed groups. Um, and there's many avenues that weapon, weaponization of food can take. Uh, it's very personal. Um, so I, I enjoyed Black sharing his personal accounts um, in that way. And I was uh, interested in hearing um, from some of you and getting to know some of you about how, um, I guess, what drew your attention to weaponization of food, what that means to you, and uh, how we might see food being used as weapons, either personally or just more broadly throughout society. Uh, so if you're interested in sharing, please tell me your name uh, and pronouns too, please. I'll go ahead and share it. So uh, my name is Luis Muñoz, and uh, I was uh, incarcerated as a juvenile um, about a half a lifetime ago. I'm 30 years old. So when I was about uh, 14, this was the first time I went to juvenile hall. And uh, I can relate to like what Ryan said. Uh, we didn't have any store or anything. So we just had to rely on what the food that was given to us. And we didn't get to choose our meals or what was in the ingredients or what was in them. And we basically got food from the county jail combined with like whatever they put together there at the juvenile hall and we had to rely on three meals a day. And when you're taught that as a juvenile, then when you release, you really don't have any idea of where to like shop for food or how to make your own meals. So they're not really setting you up for anything other than failure. And if it wasn't thanks to my brother, who um, is a phenomenal chef and just a like, uh, person that really cares about his ingredients, I would have never learned uh, how to cook my own meals and really take uh, pride in my ingredients. and uh it's uh sad that a lot of what i hear too is a lot of people saying that they can't afford it or they're living on a budget because even me with the son a four-year-old uh, i make a lot of sacrifices but I, even with my ebt i'll use the last of my like food stamps to buy like organic food and always go like organic and uh, there's plenty of places you can shop at trader joe's sprouts even costco now has organic produce so it really is attainable and i don't think anyone should be making excuses uh they're too expensive or they can't get to it because it's everywhere and now too so um, just like being on the fourth the front line of that is uh, what i'm really passionate about because like i said i went from eating like prison food to like eating super healthy and organic now and 
if I can do it, anyone can. So that's kind of my. He left out. He's also our health is wealth yeah, coordinator. So for the underground scholars, for the underground yeah. scholars, and he helps us uh, with meal prepping and meal planning and working out and and staying healthy, mind, body, and soul. So yeah. This is Daniel. He's the food bank uh, coordinator. He has a lot of stories about food that I will not tell. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we saw the, the posting and, and uh, from Landry's conversations. She worked at the PPW as well as the food bank. Uh, let's be honest, we'll give it back to you. Yeah. Okay, hi, y'all. My name is Landry. I usually hear her pronouns. Um, I work. Uh, I work at DPW in the food bank, and then I'm also co-chair of EJA, so mm. Food Justice is just, or along with Lizzie also, um, Food Justice is just something that I care a lot about, and yeah, so I'm just here to listen, but yeah, thank you all. And, uh, yeah, my name is Daniel, uh, the Food Bank Coordinator, and uh, you know, um, I'm already thinking of all these different things that I've learned and talked about, and uh, just from like you two just sharing a little bit about like, your view of the food in the world. And so um, I have a lot of years of experience working in the food systems and, and uh, currently have a decolonized urban farm that uh, grows pre-contact food. And at the food bank, we're always just trying to expand our what we can do what we can offer for um, culture rather than products you know and like how we as much as we can so. mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's awesome thank you thanks for coming and being with us today um i'm kat i need to i'm a third year environmental studies major um i am especially interested in how food justice and like providing access to healthy foods, um, like how it relates to disability justice and what kind of like repairing the food system, and how that relates to like giving agency to people who are disabled with kind of food. All right, we'll have more uh, opportunities to, to meet you with some questions later. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, it's very nice to meet all of you. Um, but there's some some avenues that I was thinking about in relation to urbanization of food uh, in our society, in our own personal lives. Talk about incarceration, talk about colonization. Um, and that plays into something I was thinking about in terms of cultural shame, food shaming. Um, this also applies to our bodies as well. Um, for example, well, food is woven into culture. It uh, informs what we eat, informs how we eat, who we eat with, what times we eat, or ritual practices. Um, it, it allows for cross-cultural dialogue. Uh, it's an element, to me at least, of what makes a house a home. Food is deeply important. Um, but oftentimes, because uh, as we've been talking about one of my classes, cultural hegemony, um, we internalize some self-hatred towards the places we come from, the foods we eat. Um, as uh, white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, you name it, all the isms. Um, they're interested in, shaping people, interested in shaping people into a cookie cutter mold. Um, so when our foods are different from things like Lunchables or turkey sandwiches, we may be shamed for it. And there's a, y'all might be familiar with Gorian Zaldua, but she um, has this passage in Nessie Shiro called La Pieta, that was pretty interesting. Um, so it starts off, Veruenza. Eating at school out of sacks, hiding our lunches, papas con chorizo behind cup hands and bowl heads or bowed heads, gobbling them out before the other kids could see it. Guilt lay folded in the tortilla. The Anglo kids laughing, calling us tortilleros. The Mexican kids taking up the word and using, using it as a club with which to hit each other. My brothers, sisters, and I started bringing white bread sandwiches to school. After a while, we stopped taking our lunch all together. Uh, so we can see the culture of the Gemini playing its way into there, and that plays into colonization of the mind as well. Um, and also body shaming. We, uh, we often hear people say, if you're skinny, just eat more. Or if you're overweight, just eat less. Um, so there's a lot of avenues that weaponization of food can take, and it's uh, deeply personal. 
Um, so, uh, does anyone want to add anything before we move on to the next topic? I wanted to yeah, just mention something. My name is Lisa, um, also part of the Underground Scholars, and um, I always am really, <laughs> I'm really big on this all because of the whole tortilla thing. It's like growing up, um, I have a parent that's from Mexico, and the other one is from um, Texas, and so growing up, we always used tortillas as like a utensil. It wasn't even a fork or a, a spoon. Like we literally used a, a tortilla. And um, that's like one of our, that was like one of our main, I don't even want to say diet because it's not a diet, it's a tortilla, right? And so it's not even uh, healthy. But what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, that was very ingrained in our culture. And just something as little as like um, experiencing a soccer game here at UCSB for the first time yeah. and seeing piles and piles of tortillas thrown on the soccer field, I felt very let down and disrespected looking around and just seeing people just throwing tortillas really on the soccer field. I understand that uh, we're like a culture of like traditions and keeping the tradition going, but I just felt that was, I would, I, I felt that wasn't okay. You know, whether it's a healthy component to your diet or not, but the whole tortilla thing, like growing up, we, it was like, how could you throw a tortilla on the field? Like I was, I felt so disrespected just because that was so ingrained in my culture. And then just seeing other, you know, um, mujeres and stuff like throwing tortillas. I was like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> but anyways, long story short, um, that's just a personal experience and opinion of mine. Um, I might have gotten off of the topic of tortillas, but no, that's, uh, a weaponization yeah. that's just right how, there. how yeah. much I felt about that situation at that soccer game. I didn't return to any more games. Yeah, we never have gone back to the soccer games due to that. And, 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 and it was crazy because when we would walk by, they would start throwing tortillas, like when we're walking by, you know, and it was like, like, what are you trying to say to us? You know, like as we're walking past, you know, but the, that's important, you know, because that's that's that goes with what we're talking about, you know, and, and UCSB has no accountability on that. They let, you know, everyone go into these games with tortillas, you know, uh, in backpacks and in trash bags. Right. And so, um, yeah, no, that's critical. And I'm glad that you bring that up because I just felt uh, like how many like people still have that as part of their culture. And for us to sit there and just waste m amounts of tortillas at a soccer game, because it's, quote unquote, a tradition of UCSB, I don't think that was okay. Right, big time, thank you for that. I, I thought of something, and, um, I, I see a lot of people like now, like uh, especially like uh, health being like really trendy, like getting rid of tortillas like all together. And it's like, it, it doesn't, it's not really the tortilla in its sense, it's like bad, it's the ingredients. So like whenever I want to enjoy a tortilla, like I go to Lazy Acres or somewhere that provides like organic, like, like where you're getting like the real deal, like actual corn. And that way, like, it's, it's not, it's not the tortilla that's bad for you. It's the ingredients that are going to make you feel bad that are going you know, to like weigh you down the processed oils, the way that they process it in general, the whole tortilla, that's what's bad for you. So there's nothing wrong with a tortilla or, or tortilla chip. It's just how it's processed and what's in it really. That's yeah. And that's important. That that's like the consciousness raising right. that has to so happen. I feel like people are like, oh, I cut, tort I cut right. tortilla out of my diet. You know, I don't eat it no more. I'm like, fine. Dude, like, right. We don't know it. how Just our food out. is processed. And that's that corporate control over how they process our foods. And then we just accept that they processed it this way and that it went through FDA uh, guidelines. And then we eat it and take it into our bodies, right? But we really don't know we're not there when they're processing this food. We're not there when they're in these plants working this meat, right? And so we really have no clue of how our food is truly being handled. And, uh, but we're still uh, trusting um, to eat it. And, and then that's causing serious health conditions within all of our families um, to uh, persist. And, uh, you know, my dad's a severe diabetic my dad has to have, you know, insulin to stay alive. And that's due to this diet that's been uh, uh, imposed on us through media, through, you know, uh, uh, through all different corporate tactics to condition our minds into accepting these certain food 
as that's our food. That's what we're supposed to be taking in. Processing of this food, not being challenged or even being thought about, right? And so that's that consciousness raising that I was important before you all joined. That was what he was talking about. Like we have to raise our consciousness and understand what we're up against. They don't care about our health. Actually, us having bad health plays into the system because the system, the healthcare system is a business. It depends on us getting sick. So uh, the different corporate control of our food supply um, plays into other systems' profits. And so, yeah. It's, well, that's you know, why it's so liberating. You right. do take your health back into your own hands. You really feel like you're in control of your life. And that's really big when there's big corporations weighing down on you and you're able to like kind of like lift them all off of you by just eating healthy and taking the time to just read ingredients and stuff like that. So, yeah. I think she oh yeah uh, hi my name is Melissa she hers um similar to that topic I feel like what thing that they're also weaponizing is that we can access these culture foods because if you think about it like avocado is getting really expensive we can't even afford our own cultural food quinoa anything in like South America anything that became mainstream and it gets too expensive for people who like culturally eat it or just eat it in general to even afford it so it's like a lockout of that and it's kind of like forcing us to eat food which is like another angle to keep it going and i feel like you can make the same argument for like coca-cola and this like chokehold that has in latin america or bananas and how all the pesticides like you were talking about affect them first then makes its way over here and we see these effects and the control but do we really see it i don't know it's just like really complicated but then that's yeah. what makes me kind of sad because i'm like i can't even afford the own food that i'm used to eating so. yeah i think to add on to that is just also like um, looking at the way that systems of oppression, you know, racism, like working capitalism itself, force people to not even have the time to look to look at what they're eating. Like, imagine if you are a fucking migrant family taking care of seven kids. How the fuck do you have time to be like, this is what I'm gonna buy. Like, I'm gonna get this. Most of the time, like EBT, I think a lot for a lot of us is we're able to live off it because of you know being in some way affiliated with the university. But for local families, like, for example, I'm from South Central, like, most of the time, we don't have time for that. For example, the only reason there's a Trader Joe in my community is because of USC. And if you look at who's actually accessing Trader Joe's, it's mostly, like, white kids and white suburban families who, and we already are police in itself, like, going to USC, for example. They ask their, like, APM, like, they report anybody who looks suspicious, aka, like, black and brown people who from the neighborhood. So you can't even go to that. And even in like organic foods and stuff, we have to think about like who is really producing our food because nothing is like, nothing is really like cruelty free, for example. Like there are migrant workers who are working, we're not even getting paid properly to like, you know, like plant those foods. And that's something so important. And it's, I feel like the reason that I came here and I've been more interested in food is because we can talk about racism, capitalism, but if all these systems fall one day and we actually become free and liberate ourselves, how are we going to sustain ourselves if we don't know how to like grow stuff? And that's re it's really hard. It is, yeah, definitely great points. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, I enjoyed uh, the exposing the organic label and how it benefits off in terms of uh, or the, the image of being that, even though it's over, very canceled. Um, I want to steer the conversation towards um, movement and autonomy. Um, and I want to start um, the term food sovereignty. Does anyone want to give a shot at defining that? Yeah. Um, food sovereignty. So it's uh, pretty much the ability for people to define what they eat, uh, how, the, how um, their diets are produced, and how they're distributed as well. So pretty much. Um, complete control of food system. Um, and the topic of movement on autonomy, um, food sovereignty to me implies being, having a deep relationship with the place that you're living in. Um, but often, oftentimes people are restricted in terms of they can move freely within their different spaces. And we see this with incarcerated people in prisons, um, business people on reservations and also missions. Um, Enslaved people on plantations, so many different aspects of um, historical oppression. Um, 
So I was uh, hoping to share the conversation to, to us and uh, interested in hearing about what you think about what it means to be place-based as people and if you nurture any relationships with certain places. Do you mind repeating the question? Yeah, what does it mean to be place-based as people and do you nurture any relationships with certain places? I've never heard that concept before. Place-based? Yeah. Uh, place-based, pretty much to uh, have a deep reciprocal connection with the place that you live in. Um, and it's kind of tricky given that we're on colonized land. Mm. We're not on, or at least we're not indigenous. Um, we're on land that's not ours. Um, we're pretty much having deep roots in a place um, seeing life as not linear but cyclical maybe like you see your ancestors in the trees um be deeply ingrained in the place that you live in usually generational yeah i would say so for myself i'm fourth generation santa barbarian so um i have a deep connection to the ocean and then like uh, any areas near the ocean so i work out at a park called white murphy field down in Santa Barbara and it's like very like empowering when you like take off your shoes and do like an outdoor workout like um on the outdoor equipment there it's very spiritual and you feel like super recharged after a nice like workout in the sun there and yeah I definitely love that place and it's just Santa Barbara in a whole and um my girlfriend she's the opposite <laughs> she's from here and she doesn't she doesn't want to stay here for much longer but um yeah I love it and I'm really grateful to be here at UCSB and be able to share this energy from our, the indigenous people like you said that it's not really our aunt like my ancestors because i'm from my mom's from mexico and my father you know it's, it, i don't really know their ancestry from that side so but it's yeah it's really powerful to be able to share that energy because here especially the energy is like we're like right, brian was saying the energy right there at the family student housing you can really feel like the drum beat in your ears sometimes when you close your ears like it gets pretty intense so you really have to honestly embrace it in a positive way and just um yeah it's been all good man yeah thank you uh, i think for me it has been a little bit difficult to garner that relationship with my food especially because of all the places that i've lived in have never really had a space to like plant food or any local like farmers markets or anything agricultural that I know who's growing my food and how it's, how it's being grown and things like that. But I guess the only experience that I can think of relating to that question is um, in my childhood when I would go and visit my grandma who lives in Guatemala and she has like her land and like she is very intentional with the type of food that she grows and who she grows it for because in the little pueblo that she lives in there's only like about like 26 families and so they all organize amongst themselves to like grow food for each other and sell it at the local um market that has like the bigger populations of people and stuff but I remember uh going when I was little and being scared when she was like oh you're gonna kill a chicken today and it's gonna be your meal for the day and if you don't do it you're not gonna eat and I was like what do you mean like i don't understand what I, I i play with the chickens like i was so confused but it really opened my eyes as to like how we view food here and how they view food over there and the respect that they have towards animals and it, it just completely changed the way that i saw like food especially like my cultural dishes and because there are some ingredients that we can't even get here in the u.s that can replicate the food that we eat over there. Um, but yeah, especially because like my grandma and like all my aunts and uncles even like uh, the cooking is very essential in our family. And so like knowing it and growing it is very part, it's a very crucial part of our like generation. So I think that's what you're asking if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. And for, for myself, uh, I'm very institutionalized. I grew up in juvenile hall. Since the age of 12 years old, I've been incarcerated. Um, and then before that, it was the school to prison pipeline. So I was told I had ADHD. They put me on medication and I was isolated in a resource room. So I was, I was pretty much being uh, uh, pushed to the side and already being groomed to go to prison, right? And so for me, I... I, it's hard for me to connect with, you know, places that I'm in. I've been in so many different places. I've traveled 
you know, uh, uh, be a van locked up in shackles and handcuffs to multiple different prison sites, multiple camps, multiple places, you know. So um, here, being here at uh, Santa Barbara, I've been able to connect, you know, having my family now and being able to, I've been free for six years now, you know, I, I've shook parole and probation. Um, my connections to this land um, are through hummingbirds. And so the hummingbirds, uh, they really show themselves to me a lot here and they really come and, and, and talk and, and get in my face and really, you know, and so, uh, but like he said, this land, it's stolen land and uh, the ancestral ties to this land are very angry. So there's, there's certain times of the month where that, uh, that dark energy comes around, right? And if you're not aware of the land that you're on and, 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 uh, and the ancestral ties that are attached to this land and you don't uh, have respect for that, it can creep in, you know, especially if you're drinking, uh, using other mind altering substances, it can creep in and it can cause you to, you know- uh, Not uh, wanna eat healthy. Yeah, not wanna eat healthy, be, become violent, become depressed. Um, a lot of things can shape, right? Um, but understanding uh, that uh, allows you to really, uh, uh, embrace this place, right? And embrace uh, those who uh, uh, came before us and those who were oppressed on this land by the mission system. And one thing I wanna announce too is the mission system was the first form of mass incarceration. You know, they forced the Chumash to live in mud huts with no windows and farm this land here. That to me is the segregated housing units of California that we're all seeing right now that are in existence today in 33 prisons across the state. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, the, 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 the beginning stages of colonization that took place is, is, is where we're at today and how we're all unattached to the lands that we walk on and live on in a lot of different forms due to capitalism. It goes to the divide and conquer that has taken place uh, through capitalism and the capitalistic project to divide and conquer us and keep us away from each other. They don't want this. You know, uh, you can't spell community without unity. But when you go to your community, there's not much unity. Who knows their neighbor here? I don't really know my neighbors. We don't really talk. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and that's important. We got to get back to the roots. And that's knowing thy neighbor. A lot of my neighbors... They don't even say hi to me. You know what I'm saying? They they walk by and don't even acknowledge that I exist. And that's where we're failing as a community. There's no unity. And that's why we're unable to embrace the places that we're in because we're always on the go. We're always being pulled this way, that way. We're divided through gender, race, um, uh, you know, identity, culture, uh, religion. We're all separated and secluded from one another. But at the end of the day, we're all human beings. But that allows this system to dehumanize us. And that allows the prison industrial complex to function and do what it does. And that's entrap and enslave people. And so, yeah, no, that's that's critical uh, to what you're asking right there about place, you know, and me and my experience, I've been so um, uh, institutionalized to the point where, you know, it's hard for me to embrace a place because I'm so in fear that the police are going to kick my door in, cuff me up and take me back to a cell because that's what they've done all my life. To me. And so it's hard for me to put roots down right and when I start to put roots down I start to look around like uh like I don't feel good about this like what's coming are they gonna come after me for some weird reason like they always do and put me away because that's where they want to keep us for the rest of our lives once we go in once you enter that system we call it the spider web you're you're stuck in the cycle of recidivism you're stuck in the revolving door there's no way out right and so yeah that's kind of my uh answer to that question right there awesome. you definitely got at the root of um, the relationship between movement autonomy um and, and place if we're restricted to a certain place it's very difficult to feel a deep connection um even if it is ancestral land as we've seen across the colonization um 
For example, when Indigenous Californians are confined to missions, even though they were on ancestral land, it completely redefined their sense of place and their ability, ability to navigate their cultural spheres as well. Um, to make rhyme. Um, sure. but, uh, um, your words made me think about how much we also think about the plants and the things that we're growing as place based. And I think oftentimes we, we think of like a veggie patch and we think of all these vegetables that are often at the supermarket, but we're not taking into account the, the, um, the food that was ancestral here, you know, that's naturally grown. We hear that like native plants sort of work, but um, there's, there's so much food in those native plants, there's so much sustenance in those things. That, I'm looking around here and it's hard to even see it look like more than a handful of native plants. And, and that concept of play space also applies to the, the environment. Yeah. And, and it goes back to what you were talking about earlier about how they control the, the banana plantations and how they control uh, the avocado plantations down, you know, what Sorry, was being, yeah, no, my bad, yeah. <laughs> and what was being mentioned earlier because um that's that's the reality of of what we're experiencing with capitalism you know uh, uh i learned in one of my classes uh william robinson really teaches a great class on 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 how you know the imf the the international monetary fund forced uh jamaica to mm -hmm. take a huge loan in order to sustain its country and sustain itself, but then told them they couldn't grow bananas no more and they couldn't export bananas. Instead, they had to import them and totally uh, 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 took away that native crop that they have lived off of for you know generations and sustained their families off of and, 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 and moved it over to South America and, and, and that was where the, the uh, control of that crop was at, right? And so I think that's important to understand. And, and you, great, you bring up great points on that, like the native uh, plants and the native crops that are in our, in our areas that were natively there at one time have been totally taken out of there and moved to a different region and controlled by corporate capitalism. So yeah, I was just going to say because that's just like that's a, a really important example. And that's something that happens here, like even in California, not necessarily with native plants, but um, I live in like super southern California. It's a really big ag community, um, like industrialized agriculture type of thing. Um, and the majority of food that we grow there, which is 80% of California's uh, produce in the winter, uh, doesn't go to us and we also have like one of the highest unemployment rates one of the highest poverty rates um it's also highest for a lot of other really horrible things but um like it's just something that i never like i thought of growing up but i didn't realize like why like why i couldn't go to like the grocery store and get something that was grown literally like two minutes away from my house and yeah so that's just it's something that i always think about and that i still continue to think about today about how like the structure of our food systems and why communities aren't getting the food that they're literally being like they're living in it. Yeah. Um, I will say I feel like I see it through like my grandpa even through a more recent generation because he's a bean, a bean farmer and um, the mice I forgot it's corn right but because of NASA and all those deals that happened all the way back he wasn't able to grow beans anymore, which is what sustained him. And even when he did want to do maize to sell, the U.S. was like, well, we're not going to, we're going to buy your maize, but then we're also going to distribute it to the U.S. specifically and then resell it to them with like corn from the U.S. So it's like, why do you export their stuff and then import stuff from the U.S.? We know it's more full of chemicals and process. So it's a weird way to keep it sustained. And now it's gone to the point where he doesn't even need to grow corn anymore because they won't buy so they completely like weed them off the system to begin with so I was just like thinking about that the conversation you were mentioning just because you see these in still like smaller rural communities and it's just like weird to think it's so close in proximity and you're just like oh I don't know I feel like it's the same thing with like Haiti where they gave them their own grain of rice to grow right and then 
They don't even like eat their own food they grow. I don't know. Yeah, it, it all comes back to food being reduced to the capital of the food and not so much as nourishment for our bodies. Uh, but we're kind of dwindling on time, so I want to bring us to the closing discussion. So, as we've learned, shit is fucked up. <laughs> um, but now we want to talk about the path forward and what we can do to combat food being used to weapon against our bodies, our minds souls or ancestors um so i'm going to start with a super broad question anyone feel free to jump in um so how do we combat the weaponization of food <laughs> we weaponize it back <laughs> <laughs> i yeah. think uh just us having this conversation and being able to you know at the institution that we're in with the resources that we have you know we're more uh, we're able to access more of this information like than other communities. And so I feel like another way to go above that is like taking that knowledge back to our own communities and like ed especially, especially educating the youth um, because they're so like keen to learning and wanting to explore different avenues of things like this. Um, and I feel like it's also, there's like not any programs at least in like lower funded schools that have things about like growing or learning about food or anything like that, not even like arts and stuff. So I feel like um, if you are pushing to be like an educator, then that would be some an area to look into, especially if you're looking into like food justice and stuff like that. So I really appreciate the space and the conversations and everything that everyone has to do. Thank you. And for me, it's unity. We have to come together as one community, you know? Um, we don't break bread together anymore. We don't, we're so separated and segregated so I feel like once we get back to being together as one, a lot of things are going to change and we're going to be able to push back at these corporate, you know, rich ruling elites that really uh, condition all of us to uh, buy into this mass consumption project that exists in all of our communities. And so I think that once we get unity back in community, a lot of things are going to change for the betterment of, of, of our next generation of our children and 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 you know and one can only hope that these conversations like we're having today can continue to grow and more people can continue to join in on this you know because we we, we have no choice like we're we're about to be the next up on the next mass extinction it's going to be us it's us humans we're on the we're on that meal plan to be extinct and we're driving ourselves extinct and it's due to us not battling against what's uh, controlling all that and that's you know capitalists and and, and uh you know the transnational corporate class and so we definitely got to have those conversations and continue them and bring that consciousness raising up for all of our communities yeah thank you um i was you you, don't, you both definitely hit at the um thought process again i was having as well um, I guess to me, I think we just need to truly nourish ourselves in every sense of the word, our communities, ourselves, the people that surround us, everyone. Um, both of the food we eat, the conversation that we're having, like this, this one right now, um, and embracing where we come from as well, because that ultimately combats food being weaponized against us and allows us to reclaim our sense of self um, and a sense of place as well. Um, also sharing food, um, at least for me, there's a lot of instances I can think of where food is my first relation or my first interaction with um, cultures that aren't seen as dominant here in the U.S. Um, and it leads into truly respecting our differences as people and where we come from as well. Um, yeah, did anyone want to touch on that question before we move on to the next one? I've just always uh, envisioned this piece of art that I saw once, and I could never find it again. So uh, it's it's uh, you know the um, during the you know, where it goes in the painting of the skeleton. So uh, I can't remember the word right now, but essentially it's this person underneath or like a level, and then zooms into the ground, and underneath is the that skeleton like the other muertos, and it's watering a seed. And on the other side is a person, us, 
and their watering of a plant and just that representation of like you're both working together at a moment there and it connects allows me to like really feel connected to my ancestors and when i work the land or i come close to um, a food memory you know and i know i not only just like uh and eating that or, or working the land, I now am, am feeling the, the connection to uh, the ancestors that pushed me to be at that moment. You know? Because I, we've talked a lot about different perspectives and different stories. Um, and there's so much nuance in that. And there's so many different experiences um, that, um, oh shoot, I lost my thing. But, it already sounds uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, yeah, there's just so much nuance in that, and that when we do kind of connect ourselves and ground ourselves to our ancestry, we can start working on intergenerational trauma, which is another component. I just think about all the different components you guys have talked about. You know, it's not just capitalism, it's not just patriarchy, it's all these different um, things forcing us to, you know, not be able to. Um, connect with people, not being able to live our uh, most authentic and, and, uh, and not be able to help others reach, you know, some sort of uh, better form of existence. Oh, sorry. No, 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 and I just wanted to um, close off with uh, somebody mentioned over here, like, okay, we can have these conversations as a collective and as, you know, cohorts and stuff, but like, what are we going to do when it does collapse, when the market collapses, and when the market collapses, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to sustain ourselves off the land that we live on, that we live on? So, you know, coming together and, you know, in big groups is good, but like, you know, taking that to your own individual knowledge and like researching, like, okay, how can I grow crops? Cause it's not about growing crops. I had grandparents too, that were raised on fields and working fields. And we wouldn't just buy strawberries all year round. Are you kidding me? My grandma would be like, no, they're not in season. And we would know which, which produce to buy at what times of the year, because they're not always in all year round. So that's another thing too. It's like knowing which produce to grow at what times of the season, when is it going to be good? And so, so you start to get that knowledge of like how to utilize your land and at what time of the season. So just, you know, you know, things like that too, is like, you know, it, it could come soon. Like people don't even want to work anymore at the grocery store. So we're starting to see a, a shift in like a, a collapsing. And if we're not aware of that, how are we going to get our food? And, and, and if we can't get our food, how are we going to grow our food and be successful? What always trips me out is that other countries have banned GMOs and they've started programs teaching people how to garden. And that's like mandatory in like preschool and like some of these like beginning years of your life. And it's not, not you don't see it here, not nowhere. You know what I mean? You can go to any store, you know, in, in some of these countries and anything you buy, like you said, it'll either be there when it's meant to be and when it's in season or it won't be right you don't have to wait for the next season so that's how it should be and you'll know too when you have strawberries or any uh, produce for example and they're in your refrigerator and they spoil in like three days yeah, yeah. you're like oh that that's good produce <laughs> it's not that it's bad that means it's good it has no additives has yeah. no anything in it but when strawberries are chilling there and they're like this big and yeah. it's like two weeks later and they're still there uh that's not good you know <laughs> and you're like oh these strawberries are still good like two weeks later no that's not good <laughs> and, and the effects are being seen across the board with our health you know um these gmos and the stuff that they're putting inside our food and the pro you know the processing chemicals that they're using it's really impacting Bro our Bro youth yeah, yeah our yeah, children, our children. My, my daughter's taller than me uh you know mentally everything. too just with like we're seeing looks, surging cases of adhd now and yeah why? adhd I mean, looks you know her friends are I'm all on. too i'm like what the heck are you guys eating but when you say that it's true like what are you eating it's literally in your food that you're eating these kids are so tall i don't remember looking like that when i was 12 i still don't look like that but um so yeah so yeah we need to be more <laughs> conscious of what we're eating awesome. I think I think to add on to that too I feel like 
um it's not really talked about a lot but you we've also seen like the weaponization of like people think being healthy means being skinny mm-hmm. and the way people police like fat bodies plus size bodies and stuff and that's again with the weaponization of food because you are putting a scapegoat on people who you're who you think are unhealthy but like just because you're skinny doesn't mean you're not you're healthy right. mm-hmm. if we're eating all this you know or not organic processed like chemical you know infused food so i just wanted to put that out there too mm-hmm. yeah no thank yeah. you for that that's important that's true uh, I think we went a little bit past, so this might be a, a good spot to, to end. Yeah, today. Have to get, head out here, you guys. It was nice okay. meeting you all. Have a <laughs> yeah. great day. Health is well. Thank you. Health is well. Um, appreciate you. It was nice meeting you. Yeah, nice meeting you too. Have a great day, sir. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, I guess, since I'm here, um, pitch some of the services that we think because, you know, you mentioned like what can we do, and I think, you know, always recognizing that I know it's hard to say that this crowd here but to like always recognize the point of privileges we have Mm -hmm. and 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 it might not be as much as uh (laughs) some of the people that we see around campus but you know we still are in a place of privilege and there's ways that we could one of the most like easiest ways being here at a university um that i tried to advocate for is that using the funds that you get in a club or as the food bank and to use that purchasing power to like affect change somehow. So we purchased, you know, from um, seeds from local native producers. Um, we've tried to buy like as much pro- uh, produce and like food that is created around here, or at least that we know where it's from. But, um, and the pitch was the seed bank. We have a seed bank where you can go and grab as many seeds as you want. So three seeds and then you come back regularly and you build start building your own little garden or something Mm -hmm. Um, but going back to that something we haven't probably talked about and and i don't know i don't feel like very uh to be honest i don't feel like a a, a expert enough to to make the statement but i i I don't know it's it's strong to say anyway is that in that nuance of like all these different experiences there's this sort of gray area and um you know, at the food bank, we we are in our leadership meetings, kind of always talking in that gray area between like the systems we're being imposed on and capitalistic ideologies and or even our own um, preconceived uh, sort of um, conditioning that we've had. And so we talk about like resources and resource management and like where can we spend our money to like bring food. But then on the other side, we're like, how do we get more food to people? You know, and there's there's internally there's always conversations about you know where do you fit uh as a person of color where do i fit as an indigenous person on turtle island being from mexico but not being from you know where the land i am from now and there's these sort of conversations that are always going to be in the gray area but it gets us closer to to where we want to be thank you for that um well, I, I enjoyed uh, sharing the space with all of you. Very good. We all came out. Um, yeah. Uh, one last thing I wanted to say is that if you didn't sign up on the Google form, I need to take down your information. Um, so if you didn't, please see me after. Do you want to close it then? Um, just thank you so much for this conversation. And I look forward to many more of these. Um, I think they're very important to build that unity within this community right here. Um, and so I appreciate all of you taking time out your busy schedules with classes and everything and joining us here today and just hearing our stories and, and sharing your own stories and your own uh, outlooks on what we're all experiencing. I think this was a very great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate all the work that's getting done. So. Hope y'all have a very nice meal. Hey, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was good. Oh my god, no, yeah, I was. Oh, I gotta go get the kids from school. Oh.